So yeah, we're going to talk about how AR um, is the next level. Let's be positive, shall we? It is the next level of engagement in arts and education. Very often the two um, go hand in hand because there's plenty to learn about the arts, isn't there? Um, and I'm here to chat with this wonderful panel um, who have some incredible projects to talk to you about that illustrate the power of when we combine XR with the arts. Um, so we're going to be speaking to Lisa, Stephanie, Vice and Kirill about their projects and I am yes. Phil, <coughs> excuse me, I'm Phil Charnick from Draw and Code um, and we're going to go through some of these things with you now. We're going to be talking a bit about, uh, we're going to perhaps be a little provocative at times. So I've got to be honest, we have rehearsed this. We all got together. Um, so this oh, is, it, it, was a, it was a little, it, maybe rehearse is, is kind of um, exaggerating things a bit. We had some pizzas and we got quite passionate about this subject matter, about arts and AR. You can't spell art without AR, can you? Um, and we went over some, some kind of uh, talking points that I, I think you'll all really enjoy to hear. Here's some of the provocations we're going to be going back to. What does AR bring to arts and education? Um, you know, do we need it is, is the big question. What does it bring? How should cu cultural organisations approach AR? Um, you know, uh, it's something that, that experts in the matter, like ourselves and many of the people in this room, um, can help with. And, and what do we advise? And is XR and interactive now essential to culture and education? Um, I, I think that project just before from um, Oxford University Press was superb. And I think that was a little illustration of, of the power of what can be done when we combine um, XR and truly engaging interactive content with education. Um, so I'm just going to introduce um, myself and our company, Draw and Code. Um, and if you want to speak to us more, we are on the expo floor, stand 163. Um, this is a project that we worked on, but I'm going to just quickly talk to you about one or two other projects uh, that we worked on, and there is one or two. I'm not going to bore you with all these, but we've completed over 150 projects during our time working in XR. Do not worry, I'm only going to show you one, otherwise we definitely wouldn't have time to go into your, your lovely work. Um, but we've worked with all sorts of uh, fantastic clients, and in the cultural space, some of the projects that we are most proud of, uh, we're from the UK and we're based in Liverpool, and we worked on uh, the Terracotta Warriors, which I think have recently um, been to Lisbon here. Um, but each uh, city gives a different take on the Warriors when they arrive in their city. And Liverpool wanted to bring immersion to it. And we did just that with a fantastic combination of uh, projection mapping and holographic effects. And the whole thing was, was a raging success. It was the UK's most successful ticketed show of any kind in 2018. Every single showing of the Terracotta Warriors show sold out. What we're looking at here is a more recent um, arts and heritage project that we did um, with Google. Um, and this was to show the pyramids of Moreau that are in Sudan. And you can go and look this up if you look up Google and Moreau, um, that's M-E-R. OE. Um, you can try it for yourself. If you are on um, an Android device, it will magically come to life in augmented reality. This is basically a, a WebXR project that combined photogrammetry, it combines video, it combines Google Earth, it combines Street View and augmented reality all into one project. Um, our role was, uh, was mainly to kind of convert all these incredible photogrammetry and other kind of photographic reference images into something really engaging, really exciting, and really beautiful. Um, but now we are going to talk about um, the panel and some of their fantastic work. So, Lisa and Vice, if you want to speak to us about yourselves and about Colours and Antiquity. Thanks, Phil. Um, so, uh, really excited to be here. It's the first time we've been in AW uh, Europe. And um, we're here to talk about AR, AR in education, AR in arts and culture, and also to talk about our project. Uh, so my name is Vice. Um, it's my last name. My first name is hard to pronounce. I go by Vice. Um, I'm, I have a development studio um, based in Canada, and I'm a coder myself. Um, and I've joined forces with Lisa, and she will introduce herself in a second. And Jump to the next slide. Yes, thank yeah, you. So basically two studios. Vice is a development studio. I'm a user experience design studio. I'm based in Brooklyn, New York, and we often combine our powers into one and work on really exciting interactive projects, VR, AR, interactive narratives. 
So we have combined forces for this particular project. And if we can jump to the next slide, I'm actually going to give everybody a really brief art history lesson. I'm going to be really quick, but this is just to give you a it's little bit though. of context into what we've been working on. I think your microphone is working. Oh. No, it is. It's working. Is that all right? I can speak louder. Uh, so this is what most people imagine when they think about ancient Greece. They think of the white marble statues in museums like the Metropolitan or the British Museum. They think of these dusty columns in structures like the Parthenon. Most people's vision of antiquity is entirely devoid of color. The problem with that is that it's fundamentally wrong, right? One of the biggest misconceptions of Western art history is that the Greco-Roman world, the ancient world, was monochromatic, when in fact it wasn't at all. If we can jump to the next slide, antiquity was extremely colorful. It, was, it looked vastly different than what we see today in textbooks and in museums and at art historical sites. Uh, most sculptures were really, really colorful. They were brightly colored in glimmering golds and blues and reds. So our perception of the ancient world is just completely not what it actually used to look like. So that's the basis of our project. And if we jump to the next slide, uh, here is our pilot project. It's called The Victorious Athletes, and it is about an ancient statue that is at the Getty Villa in Los Angeles. And if we can play this video, please. Oh, I must apologize. That's not working, the video. Oh, apologies. Any way to jump back and play it? <laughs> I don't know. I don't think I can at this point. I'm sorry. Uh. You can go back one more slide. Yeah, this one. Is there a, is there a way to play this video in the back there? I don't think that's the video. Oh, apologies. This is a way to get everyone super curious. <laughs> everyone goes quickly yeah. looking. Yeah. Like, <laughs> nice try. <laughs> okay. Um, well, we can try to describe it to you if you jump to the next slide. Um, so this is the this is a picture of the victorious athlete. He is a statue that was made almost two and a half thousand years ago. He was made in 310 BC in ancient Greece, and this is what he looks like now. But originally, he looked. Nothing like this. Um, he was completely different in antiquity. He was colored. Uh, he was a bronze, golden color. He had inlaid eyes uh, that were a glass and pastel inlays, inserts in his eyes. His nipples and his lips were copper. So they had actual different details made of different types of metals on the statue. Um, and what we did with our project is that we reveal what the statue looks like originally in antiquity. So museum visitors can come to the gallery space and they can point their phones at the statue and they can see what it looks like originally when it was first found. And it's actually a three chapter story. So not only could they see what it looked like originally, but they can also see what it looks like when it was first found underwater. So this sculpture was found in 1964 in the Adriatic Sea and it was covered in barnacles. It looked kind of nothing like this. It was encrusted in marine life, um, and there are photo archives of what he used to look like. So one of the chapters in our AR app is people can actually see what he looks like when he was first pulled out of the water. And then finally, the third chapter of this application, it's an x-ray view. So it actually allows people to point their phones at the statue and see an x-ray of what's inside of the sculpture and they can learn how bronze is cast, how ancient bronze is cast. They can see that there's this steel rod that's going inside of his body. I wish we had a video so that you can see this. Um, but there's a bronze, uh, there's a steel rod that's inside of him and that's holding up, that's mounting the sculpture in the actual gallery space. Um, so there's all sorts of learnings that uh, visitors to the museum can have while looking at the statue and through the help of our AR application. So that's kind of one of our pilot projects, and that's the context that we bring to this conversation. Wow, thank you so much. Um, apologies, we didn't get to see the video. Um, and uh, so, so this is, uh, I mean, for me, that is just a fantastic use uh, of AR because it's things that we can't see. 
even if you are there, even if you're in front of that statue, so even if, you know, we're, we're talking about, uh, you know, even if you're in that same place with it, you still can't see the whole story at all. Um, so that is a fantastic use of AR to reveal um, what is going on there. Now, if Stefan Carrill, if you could introduce your project to us. Yes, happily. So hello, everyone. My name is Stephanie from Belgium. This is Kirill. Uh, so we have a project that we're presenting today is a walking museum. So we are bringing art and history to life with augmented reality. So this started in 2020. We all know what happened in that year. Uh, all of a sudden, there was no access anymore to museums. People were stuck. Um, and I thought that was not fair. So our team came up with this project where we brought art outside and we brought it to life with augmented reality. And it's funny how everything worked well with one another because people started to use QR codes more and more. Everyone was using their smartphone, understood even little children, elderly people in the restaurants now, they all know what a QR code is. So we played into that and we created this outdoor walking tour where we brought to life 16th century paintings, mainly by Bruegel. And we told the story of a legend. So this is happening in Belgium, near Bruges, in the city called Dam. And we're going to show you a video of what we did. So we have this educational app that makes you dive into the history where you see characters come to life. It's a really interesting mix of actually even theater, animation, 2D, 3D, audio guide, where you literally get to know the whole 16th century. And the story is told to you by the painting itself. So we can watch this video now to give you a clear understanding of what we're doing. Do I press one more time? That's our project, and the funny part is really that sometimes people say, oh, that's really nice for kids, but actually we see that the older people are, the more they're intrigued by the whole story coming to life and diving into this whole 16th century. And so we partnered up with Kirill, who has eight years experience in the industry, and really made this great fusion of um, tech and creativity, and here we are. This is our pilot project, and so we're moving on in Belgium, also talking to a lot of different museums how to implement into their program these technologies and these storytelling. Yeah, uh, hi everyone, uh, my name is Kirill and I'm so happy to be here, to be here with you, with, uh, with all of us. Um, so yeah, uh, I'm co-founder of uh, Like a Star Studio, it's a studio for developing uh, XR projects. So we create uh, more than 250 projects already, but uh, this project that you see now is the most beautiful and uh, most uh, incredible project that I work in with and uh, I really love it. <laughs> it's, it's, uh, it's the best uh, animation that I ever see in ER and as I already said, we've done 250 projects. I know <laughs> what I mean. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so well, the good news is our video is up there so we can see it now. Oh, great. Fantastic. Ah, okay. Amazing. Let me do I click next? It's still here? Or is it just going to play? Hopefully it'll play it. <laughs> there we go. There's also audio. This is the victorious The statue looked very different than it did in ancient Greece. Originally, it looked more like this. Victorious Athlete in Augmented Reality offers museum visitors an entirely new way to engage with art. Using AR, the app reveals the statue's long-lost history. It encourages inquiry 
and rewards visitors with a deeper understanding and appreciation for this spectacular ancient bronze. Visitors can even see what the statue looked like when it was found in modern times. Before conservation, it looked like this. There's also an X-ray view. All of the digital reconstructions are based on rigorous research, references from literature and art history, and a few well-founded guesses. Thanks, guys. That's fantastic, isn't it? Um, I'm sure you'll agree that that is quite something. So, as you can see, um, the panel here have a lot of experience and some incredible projects to talk about. But we're going to talk about uh, a more general um, kind of question. And what value does technology, and particularly, obviously, AR and XR generally, what does it bring to culture? Um, is it something that culture needs? Is it something that culture wants? Stephanie? Um, does it need it? I, the answer is yes, completely. Does it want it? We're getting there. Slowly. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so obviously, I think that it's magnificent that with this technology, as Lisa and Vice Projects is doing as well, you can unlock so, so much information, so much historical, valuable information that people don't have access to. They simply don't, because not everyone's going to come to the museum when they're a bag full of books and start, OK, so this was this year. And, this year. and now we have a technology with people, creative teams, developers, like beautiful teams of experienced people that just do the job for you. And you just have to open your smartphone, the gadget you have every day with you, point it towards the artwork or the sculpture, and enjoy the show, literally, and get educated as well. So I think this is a major breakthrough, and institutions, and we'll get to that Yes. later, <laughs> I won't spoil yeah. um, are I think they're in the process of, of getting acquainted with the technology. Um, it's amazing that in Los Angeles this is being done, so they are, are now having a clear vision of what's possible. We're in Belgium busy with our, the, we're making the pathway to getting this uh, technology accepted, actually, by the, the cultural uh, institutions. So that's, that's very interesting, isn't it, when, you know, as we know uh, in this room, it's you know what we do is presented as a niche it's not necessarily um because the sheer amount of numbers who will use ar every single day via social media um it is mainstream but as you say it's about it's about getting accepted isn't it um is it a similar story for yourselves because i was i've got to admit when you started explaining the project to me I, sorry i'm gonna sound really uncultured and uneducated here but a lot of it was a surprise to me when you were explaining the uh you know, as I say, I picture these uh, uh, statues as being that single material and not necessarily having the history that they do. And it, it was a real surprise to me. And so, yeah. yeah, do you feel that that is, now you've done that, do, do you feel like going and seeing something from that era now requires, even if it's not the, the, this particular use of technology, but does it need that really visual and really visceral explanation of, of where it's come from and what it is? So yeah, the reason we started this project is because um, we were talking about AR, we were working together on different projects, and we wanted to find um, a solution, find a juicy problem where AR gives value to the user. Um, because we've seen many AR projects where it wasn't exactly clear how it contributes, but here it's evidently and immediately clear that AR gives value to the experience. By adding these layers that you cannot see on a physical object, um, and teaching you something new about it when it's right in front of you. Yeah, and I'll add to that that museums today are constantly thinking of new ways to engage the public and to tell stories about their collection. And we've really found that AR, if done right, could be a really powerful tool for engagement and for learning. And we've seen multiple examples of this. So we've done, we've conducted a ton of user testing with this application. And visitor reaction is really quite phenomenal. People are really excited to use this thing. Uh, just to give you an example, we had student groups coming into the gallery. And they were high school students. And they were you know, coming in. And they were you know, typical students, kind of bored and rolling their eyes that they have to look at this old piece of metal. And when we gave them this app, they just lit up. You know, all of a sudden, they were actually willing to learn something and to engage. 
And we know that when people are engaged or interested in a topic, their knowledge retention is much higher. Uh, so that was really wonderful to see. We also worked with docents in the gallery space, and they would tell us that, you know, before they would do these gallery tours and they would point to this object and they, they would say to, their, uh, to the people on their tours, you know, now close your eyes and imagine what this could have looked like 2,000 years ago. And we were able to give them this tool that actually showed people what it may have looked like. So we really think that the value that this brings is in education and learning and engagement and interpretation of art and of art history. Well, what you were saying there about, um, uh, you know, uh, and you've done this research and uh, the audience were delighted they were engaged. Kirill, you've been uh, a part of so many, uh, you know, you're very prolific. You've been a part of so many different XR projects. Is that a common thread through them? D does it engage? Does it delight? And, and is, that, is that as much as we need to say to cultural organisations mm -hmm. as, as a rationale for why they should embrace this technology? Um, it's a very interesting question. I actually think uh, if um, everything we know about the history of the world, everything we know about the history of ancient, uh, ancient Greece and Rome, uh, about the development of civilization, uh, we know from the notes of uh, the contemporaries of this, that time. Uh, everything we know about the, any um, historical event, we know from the participants of this event. So let me ask you a question. Uh, how it's for better understanding uh, the scale and the meaning of such event like uh, Fall of Berlin Wall? Yeah. By reading about this uh, in a book or by going back in time and uh, experiencing yourself as a part of it, to see everything uh, by your own eyes uh, and uh, see other people, uh, see other humans who um, really uh, feel this. No, that's the, yeah, that's, that's it. It's the, the passion and that feeling, especially something within living memory. We shouldn't lose that, you know, this, this can help hang on to that. If, so I, if I can add to that, I just wanted to say out of our experience also with the project is that we used um, a lot of voices, obviously, to do the audio guide and there are young people um, involved as well. And so we have some actors also. And there's this young guy, he's, I think, yeah, 16, and he's like a bit of a TikTok star in Belgium. And we got him on board because his dad was offering, he's also an actor to, to participate. And I thought, like, he's going to come to the studio, quickly say his text and run off because it's not maybe staying Bruegel in the 16th century. And um, what was really amazing is that he was like, wow, it's coming to life, and oh my god, and, and what's the story behind it, and are you sure, are you really, and the guy, he just lost it for a moment, he was like, I want to know everything about history, and of course it's so linked to the history of Flanders in the 16th century, why we're not together with the Netherlands, and children, well, well young adults, they don't know this history, they're just yeah. not busy with this, because TikTok is so much more interesting to, to this cute little dance, and then, but this is cool, because AR, VR, they can reintroduce these, important, in my opinion, educational topics in a really fun and play, playful manner. And that's really powerful. And I think we can both see it with these projects, how intense and powerful it is. So, yeah, 100%. And, and in, so, so to go to one of the other kind of uh, big questions here, um, how should cultural organizations approach the use of, of XR and other associated technologies? And by that, I, I partly mean in terms of um, do they understand how um, people who create these experiences work? Is it a totally different world? And is it something that you almost need a, a go-between? Is there, is there anything that they can do to be more prepared for, for what comes next technology-wise? Sure. Um, I think at least a recommendation that I would give to cultural institutions, really to anybody, is that when you're approaching, when you're using immersive technology, you should be doing so with thought and intention, right? So you shouldn't just take a technology just because it's the cool new thing. We've had so many clients come to us and say, you know, I want an AR app, I want a VR app, I want a NFT blockchain metaverse, fill in the blank with a buzzword. And I think that as industry professionals, our job is to advocate for meaningful uses of technology. Um, and that's the case with museums as well, and that's what we've been trying to do. Yeah, that, that's, yeah, so, so some people will be, in our experience, set on a technology. I want to exploit this technology for whatever reason. Other people are more saying, how do we engage an audience and then leave it to you to recommend a technology and approach to it. Um, 
with yourselves? Was it the technology or was it the creative concept first? Um, which which way round did that happen? Creative concept first. Oh, okay, fantastic. Really being a bit, actually me being 12 years old a while ago and looking at this painting and being like, what's happening in this painting? Who are these characters? What are they saying to each other? What is the time they're living in? What is the century? What's happening in history, etc., etc. So definitely first the creative and then, so what do we have? What are the tools we have today? And then thinking back to this AR photos that came to life with videos like the first mm -hmm. use cases. And being like, can we use that actually? Like, can we do something with that in, in 16th century paintings and put a bit of like all these elements together? And it can. And if to answer to the question that was being asked, I think that museums, um, they're first, um, they're, they're afraid because of course they want to preserve the cultural heritage that they're representing in their spaces. But they must not forget about their educational purpose. And I think that by focusing so much on that first part of preservation and being the owners of this is our museum, this is our collection, and we, we don't want technology to come in and sl slam the door with special effects. This is not us, it's not about us. And forgetting the educational purpose and the potential that that has. But it's a warm up phase. I think yes. like it was a ice age and now the little cracks are coming and soon we'll so. be all swimming in AR, VR um, yeah, experiences. And, and we've seen museums do this over time with photography, for example. Years ago, most museums were prohibiting photography in, inside of the museum, right? And now most of them do. So they, there's a movement that um, the museums understand that the more they open the content, um, they're not competing with themselves. They're, it's quite the opposite. They are drawing in people to come and visit the museum. So now they freely give away 2D information. Um, some of them, we're seeing very uh, beginnings of giving away 3D information, like 3D scans or 3D models, and it's coming. So they are, they are understanding that the more you give away to the public, the more people will actually want to come and see this thing in person. That's, that's a really interesting point. So uh, obviously museums and other similar organizations, they're on a, a big push for digitization, whatever form that may take. If it's a 3D object, maybe that's photogrammetry. If it's an audio record or something, maybe it's high quality digital recording of it. Um, and as you're hinting at there, um, it's something where they've got this amazing resource and we'd love that in our sandbox, wouldn't we, as, as kind of creators for interactive experiences. Wouldn't that be great to have all the world's antiquities to play with um, in your toy box? Um, and so what you're saying there is potentially that day is coming. I mean, it's, it, is that something where um, that amazing resource that's out there, do you think it's, I mean, what you're describing there is kind of something that would be a paradise if you know, as you say, the, the waters melt and, and the flood comes of all this fantastic, yeah, fantastic so content. Slowly, yeah, but they're melting. Um, <laughs> but do you think at the moment it's about engaging individual organisations, individual projects and getting them to open up and then they, you know, uh, the wider um, community will see how this would be used if put into the hands of really creative and interesting people? Um, I think that it's um, a very good question about a mass adoption of XR in uh, not only museum art and uh, culture industry, but uh, all, all industries. Because it's our, XR is such a such technology that can, can improve so many processes in uh, all kinds of in industries. Uh, I think that uh, our, main, uh, our main task, our main goal for XR guys um, is um, to create as many projects, as many creative, cool, uh, amazing projects uh, that is possible for now. Because uh, we uh, should uh, become um, not initiators, we should become consultants and developers. But for now, we are initiators, we are creators, we are creatives, we should sell the idea to the museum, we should sell this interest uh, to the school institution, etc., etc., etc. But when we have uh, this mass adoption, uh, they will create uh, the idea for themselves and it will be much more better because they know much more uh, better their uh, industry than us. Okay. And uh, that's, that's the other thing that, that you were touching upon there was the potential that would some organisations see um, what we're doing with XR as being a threat to some traditional aspects of, of the way these organisations work. So what I was thinking of particularly um, was a, a conversation that I had with a cultural organisation in the UK um, immediately before lockdown. It was, I think, the second to last thing event of any kind that I went to before the UK went into lockdown in 2020. And 
basically she was from a, a, a organization that's a caretaker of a beautiful building it's incredible but i'd never been to it and i was saying i'd love to go to that but it's in a far-flung corner of the uk rather difficult for me to access i'd love to be able to step inside there and i started talking to her going have you ever thought about putting this venue in vr you know getting some kind of uh, scan or, or other kind of representation of it where people could step inside and she was going why would i not want people to visit my venue why would i want them to visit in in vr and when we're talking about what you've all done in AR, it's been quite place specific and, uh, and uh, particularly with, with what you were doing, Stephanie, it's very, very place specific indeed. And do you feel like that's something that, that brings something to that place? And these, these people are custodians, not only of art and culture, but of a location of a space. Do you feel like it's something they should embrace to, to open up where they are to the world, not just what they do? Well, we're uh, location specific in a way, yes, in a way not, because actually we have the reproductions of the paintings that we yeah. put outside, right? So, um, of course, the museums from where these paintings come, they're in Berlin, Vienna, uh, Brussels, uh, Antwerp, they are, yeah, they're not getting it, uh, the whole picture yet, you know, so they're qu quite protective. And I think that the, the main idea that a cultural institution must get, and also historians and people that are, is that, the AR twin or the VR twin does not replace the initial object. It's like yeah. the VR projection of that space that you were talking about just now is not a replacement for the beautiful space it is in itself. It's like a promotional video. It's like a, it's, it's, it's a push to be like, get more interest in this, be inspired by this, get to know the place. We've discussed this when we were together before. It's just when you see it in the VR version, you're even more inspired to go see the original one. And yeah, it's not the same because it's a digital twin, but it doesn't mean that that denies the magnificent um, vibe and authenticity of the initial object. It just amplifies it. And I think when museums and cultural institutions and galleries will we'll get this, then we'll make a major breakthrough and then we get, can get together all the table and indeed get their knowledge in the, in the space instead of us being like, ah, oh, maybe you should do this and this. No, they will bring it, it in and it will create magnificent, magnificent projects. And a, a similar thing, Lisa, as well. So when we're talking about um, objects um, that are being brought to life, as, as you were doing with your project, um, these are what you are doing, you know, how I perceive it is that you're bringing something extra to them. You're not changing what they are and you're not changing uh, whether somebody should go and visit them and see them as they are today or not. And if they want to hold up a smartphone and see something more and learn more and see something animated and, and dynamic, they can do. And if they don't want to, they can put the phone down again in the future. They can take off their glasses, I guess and you're back in the room, you're back there with them as they are today, if you want that, that purest approach. We had a similar thing with Terracotta Warriors, where um, to a, there was kind of technical and uh, kind of cultural uh, limitations in terms of how expressive we could be with the artifacts themselves. Um, and we found that basically almost annotating and animating what was around them was more effective. So again, we were not interrupting what that what that was. If you were a purist and went, I have seen these objects, I've seen them on a screen, I've read about them in a book, I want to see them as they are today. I don't want to see some crazy video game version of them. But you're offering basically both. You know, it doesn't, it doesn't change the experience, but it adds to the experience. Yeah, we had a few museums who were worried about, you know, they don't want people in their gallery just going like this, you know, and just staring into their phone and that's it. And our response to that are, people are kind of doing that anyway. Um, but in addition to that, we actually found the opposite to be true. So with this app, we found people, you know, looking through, looking through the app, looking at the recreation, and then that actually triggered their curiosity to look at the object in front of them more without their phone. And so what they were doing is they were actually comparing and contrasting, you know, they're looking at the recreation and then they're looking at the original object in front of them and they're like, oh, I didn't notice that before. Uh, the victorious athlete is a really great example. So he's, he's a victorious athlete. He is the victor of the Olympic games. And one of the reasons that we know that is because he's wearing an olive wreath on his head. In the original objects, that olive wreath is corroded. You can barely see it. And so in our recreation, you can see it because we've recreated it, we've kind of fixed the leaves and it's gold. And so people, they're looking through their phones and they're seeing that gilded reef. And then they're, you know, they're 
going off of their phones and they're trying to find it on the original sculpture. So that back and forth between engaging with a physical object in front of you and then using this tool, this AR tool as a supplement, we found that to be really effective. And advice was something you and I were just mentioning was often, you know, we, we need to ask why AR? Why is that the right technology for certain scenarios and, and to get across certain points? Um, I mean, I, I feel like it's quite self-explanatory what, what you're doing there. Do you feel like um, that's the only technology that could achieve this, that could take you back in time while still preserving and still making you, as you say, more likely to go and look at that object that is sat yes. there? Yeah. So we wanted something that would enhance the experience on site, that would not subtract it, not replace it, but actually um, add something, right? So you want, to, you want to entice people to come and visit this sort of sculpture in person so they can have this additional information on top of it. We're also working on a kind of a home version where some of this information will be available um, in a browser. There's, there's a lot of discussion back and forth about how exactly we're going to implement this. Um, but our, our goal was, was AR and, and, and the use of AR that's, that's immediately valuable on site. And it's, it's something as well that, that you were touching on there as well, Lisa, was about um, is this, will technology bring in new audiences? So somebody who may not engage um, with, you know, again, I don't know if your research showed that, but would, is there the potential that there's people who would not engage at all with um, these kind of uh, cultural spaces, cultural artifacts, without there being a technology layer? Uh, but Carol, you've done a lot of projects. What, do you find that that will bring in new audiences, people who are going there for the technology first rather than the content? Um. It's a good question. I actually think that uh, visitors of the museum have no specific expectation uh, of um, immersive uh, content, immersive experience, because uh, first of all, they come for art, and uh, the XR and other immersive uh, experience is just an additional tool, um, additional part of uh, immersive content, information, storytelling, uh, and etc. So uh, that's that's what I think. Yeah. I sorry. No, go ahead. I, I have a, I have a little a little bit addition. So um, XR as a um, marketing tool, as a tool for attracting a new audience, uh, exactly not working as a customer magnet without marketing support, because uh, all your future clients, all your future visitors, and uh, also your uh, customers that have already been uh, in your museum should know that they have a reason to visit you again or for the first time. Yeah. Well, I think that a lot of people, when they hear something immersive and they're like, oh, we're going to get immersed, and whether it's in Van Gogh, Gustav Klimt, or, or whatever, they don't really care initially. But then it's cool because they would have been triggered initially by art, but then they get into a project that's actually educational, so they come out with both. So I think that's beautiful. And I think that people that are come, for, come from the arts, initially they're not expecting, as Kirill says, uh, any XR effects. But if they get to the point where they get actually the tool in their hands and they start exploring, I think they will even enjoy it more because we get feedback of uh, PhD uh, arts, um, PhDs in arts that are like, I went with my boyfriend and we, we learned so many new and interesting things and that I even didn't know. Because, I mean, you, you have a whole team of people that want to bring a certain message, a certain information, and it's, it's very enriching. Even if you know everything about Bruegel, if you think you know everything about the 16th century, still try the app, you'll be surprised. And I think that's the beauty, is that you, you keep learning, it's a learning curve, and that technology enhances it, so. And, and Lisa, you, you were saying about um, uh, the, the kind of research and the reaction. Uh, do you feel like the more interaction, the more engaging it could get, or is it, is it not as simple, is it more about um, the story you're telling? I don't necessarily think that more interaction is better. I think that everybody interacts with technology differently and it's good to have multiple levels of interaction. So some people, we just want to point their phones at the sculpture, see the recreation, be wowed, and that's it. Other people want to dig deeper into the content and they want to actually learn the details. So they want to actually click on those hotspots and they want to learn about that olive wreath or they want to learn about, you know, why are his eyes hollow right now, but what did they look like originally? Uh, so I think it's a matter of allowing users to engage as much or as little as they want to. I think that the really cool thing about AR is that 
you can teach something to someone instantly, right? Right away, you, you get this vision of this sculpture and you're like, holy crap, it looks nothing like what it looks like now. And I think that's really powerful. Yeah. And we, we, did, we, test, we did testing with people at, uh, at the venue, at the museum, and there were interactions that we designed, and after we saw people actually doing them, we decided that we would remove these interactions, because they were clunky, they were cumbersome, they were actually taking away from the experience. Wow. Okay. Um, so we, we, we went in waves, we, like, we made things complex, and then we simplified it until we found the right place to be in. So there's no easy answer, but sometimes interaction is necessary, sometimes it contributes, and sometimes it doesn't. You just have to figure out which is which. And it's, that, that, that's really fascinating to hear that the project was, was changing its form as it, as it unfolded there. Um, in terms of working with, I hope nobody's sensitive here, let's, let's, um, let's guard our words, I, I don't know if we've got any cultural organisations here, but they, is it a case of when you are working with a cultural organisation, do you have to work... You know, do you have to dance their tune? Is it a different world to what you're used to with other clients? So if you've got a client coming to you from, uh, you know, from marketing or from sports or something like that, is it a vastly different approach you have to take? Do you have to um, you know, be very sensitive to the content that, that you're potentially going to be uh, playing with? Yeah, um, I think it's, uh, it's a good question. Uh, first of all, we have, like, uh, as you know, I think we have two um, different type of uh, clients. So first, first of all, there are clients who initiated the XR project, project themselves. So they are already uh, interested in the implementation of XR project. They not necessarily distinguish AR from VR, but they are already interested in this. And uh, our main purpose, our main task is to uh, dive deep in their processes, understand what goals they set be, um, for themselves, what uh, problems they try to solve, and only after that we can uh, offer them the most suitable solution. Uh, and uh, on the other hand, there are clients who just um, already heard what XR is, okay. but um, many of them really thinking that it's just a game. And for this client, we should uh, for this type of type of clients, we should uh, sell this interest, sell, sell this idea, uh, and. Uh, we should really dive deeper in uh, all their ideas to create uh, a good project for them. Uh, because if it will be not good, they will not use XR anymore. I think, I think with cultural institutions, if you come to a client and you want to do this massive uh, ad or it's like loud and effects and yeah, we want more and more. At a museum, when you come to a museum or a cultural institution, Quiet, we're gonna put a bit of this, fine tuning here, a bit Let's of that. Let's just stick to a video. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we can do that, yeah, exactly. That was just 2D, no animation. So, but bit by bit, and then they see it and they try it, and oh, can we? And then they are the ones who are like, oh, maybe we should do that. I was like, told you from the beginning, right? <laughs> so, it's a bit of a process, of course. Like, they're very careful, as I said, they're about preservation, they're not about animation. So, you have to combine these two a little bit, like, you know, very carefully. Do you think there's, there is another extreme to it as well, where it gets experiential? You know, if you think of the Van Gogh exhibition, you know, and that's big success and, and touring in multiple locations around the world. And that is something that's less interactive, but it's very, very immersive in, in the kind of truest sense of the word. It, it's all encompassing for the senses, basically, isn't it? Um, do you think the success of experiential uh, venues, events, um, do you think that could drive um, culture to embrace, you know, go even deeper and even further in? Will they see that? Is that how they operate? Do they look at um, something like that and go, I want a piece of that pie, that, that looks good? Or is that not how, are they very much kind of custodians of, of what they work on very specifically and just want what's best for that? I, I think to many it looks like a horror movie, to be honest. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's tricky because you have all of these classical museums and they're competing with Instagrammable exhibitions, right? So everybody is going to see the immersive Van Gogh and nobody's going to see the Greco-Roman sculptures anymore. Um, so it's a balance. It's like, how do you get people in to look at art historical objects and to get people excited when they're so overloaded with all of these other exhibitions in these big cities? It's quite, it's a challenge, but I think it's one that's really worthy, right? It's like, we should get young people and people who are in, into Instagram. We should get them to these institutions and to get them excited about art 
And I think all of us here, we're, we're trying to do that and we're trying to utilize immersive technology to engage people. And in terms of that, that visitor attraction element, vice versa, is it something that, um, again, is it something where potentially you could see XR and, and other technologies um, being the star of the show? Um, you turn up to be immersed. You don't necessarily turn up to be in, enlightened. Um, is, that, is that the way around things could get it, if, if that trend continues? It, it's a good trend because it brings the attention to the, to the public of these technologies and these events. Uh, but it very much depends on the venue and what exactly the goal of the, uh, of the experience is. Uh, so some experiences, the goal is to immerse you completely and, and like the Van Gogh um, uh, spectacles. Um, in, in other places like uh, where we worked in, in the museum, um, our goal was to engage people in, in, in a very tight and controlled manner. Um, and the focus is the object, not the actual AR experience. Um, and we wanted to give them agency, we wanted to give them, um, going back to the original or the previous question about creative agency or creative uh, work spectrum you can move in, um, even with our sculpture, we worked with art historians to figure out exactly these replications or these, sorry, restorations and how they should have looked like his eyes, the object he was holding in his hand, the color of the bronze, but a lot is unknown. So in that space of unknown, there is artistic freedom, right? We, we gave the users an option, for example, we gave the users an option to pick the shade or the hue of bronze uh, because we don't really know what hue of bronze, exactly of bronze that he was originally. But we do know that it was bronze, so there's only a certain range of colors that is feasible. So those are the colors that we give to the user. So we kind of try to work within the historical bounds to give some creativity to the user and to ourselves in that specific project. In other projects, you have a bigger spectrum to work in. So it totally depends on, on what your goal is and who, who the target audience. And I think that touches upon a really interesting point, which is this technology allows visitors to have agency. Right? And when you have agency and when you're able to participate in a topic, uh, not only is that more engaging, but that helps you retain information better and that helps you connect with the content. Uh, so that was one way that we were doing it in your project as well. I'm sure just you know through the animations and through the interactions, again, it's a much more engaging and it's a much more rich experience. Mm -hmm. um, and users have agency to actually do something with it as opposed to just stare at a painting. Um, and that helps with engagement and that helps with learning as well. So. And, and Stephanie, what, what you were saying there is really interesting about that room for interpretation. Um, that it, it isn't, you know, you're adding something that was there. Um, but there's also some unknown elements that you need to fill in the blanks. And Stephanie, it's a similar, this, this is our last question, by the way, everybody. So we're about to run out of time, so, so I'll, I'll put you on the spot. Did you feel like as you um, worked on the paintings, you're having to go, what would they do if they are animated? They are not. And that's, I presume, up to you to interpret. And so you're almost collaborating with something that's been made in history years ago and you're having to go how, how would I work together it's, with this artist and this artwork? It's a big responsibility and it's not me, I mean it's yeah. like the whole team of of course one side the art historians that are working on it, the creatives and then trying to find that balance between what is correct, what is outrageous for some people to see um, and of course stating that it's an interpretation of course but our goal is to educate and to tell the story and I mean it's like when you have a really good book and then you have the movie made out of it, of course it's always going to differ in some people. but in the book it was not like this, I don't remember this. So, yeah okay but it's a movie like when we're trying to tell the story at the end you remember the movie, much more people saw the movie than read the book maybe so I mean and this is really important and it's, it's, a, it's a nice learning curve and some institutions are more difficult, some are more easier but at the end of the day I think there's a really great process going of, of like the development in this area and I think we're about to see amazing projects in museums all over the world so looking forward to that. Fantastic well thank you everybody and that's all we have time for and thank you everyone for coming down and listening to us pontificate about um, where AR arts and education all collide. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.